everybody. Happy Friday. <laughs> Welcome again to another Friday garden chat from our living room. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be live for the next hour or so answering your questions about growing food or app. Um, anything else related to that? Just start firing away in the chat. Yeah. And we have Andrew helping us out today. So he's going to be pulling up your questions for us and putting them down below. So that way we can read them and answer them here. So we've had, it's, it's it's the fun time of the year in gardening for us because everything is starting to like really grow fast. So that, that includes weeds. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, this was this morning right here. This was first thing smart with, this is the first day that we have actually had sun shining. We've had a lot of storms, lots of rain, like the last, whole last week. So the plants was, have loved it though. Yeah. It was beautiful this morning. So we wanted to share that's our garden right now. So let's talk a little bit about some of the issues we're having this week. Yeah. Which the biggest issue we're fighting is that not only are the plants growing really well right now, but the weeds are growing really well right now also. So uh, we've been having a lot of issues with weeds, um, not necessarily in the garden, but around the garden, uh, around our beds. And the problem is that, that will eventually grow into your garden. So you got to make sure you get ahead of that. So we're trying to do that this year because last year it got out of control. So I've been having a lot of fun going through with my propane torch. He's not joking. He has been having a lot of fun fighting the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just literally there's these propane torches. You can get you can get them on Amazon or Tractor Supply. Um, but you just hook it up to a propane bottle and you light it on fire. And it's just like a, a big jet. It's awesome. <laughs> it's so much fun. So uh, I just go through and I blast the weeds with the heat for just a few seconds. And um, you don't have to like crispy the plants. You just have to hit them for a few seconds and that's enough to, to kill them. And then uh, it does a really good job of helping us knock down weeds because we have a really large area that we're trying to contain. And um, our chickens handle it for, for the most part around our farm. But Anywhere the gardens are, the chickens can't be. So that's where we have the issues. So mm -hmm. been doing a lot of that this week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, it looks, I mean, it, it only looks bad for like a day because you can tell you burned it. And then like the next day, it's it looks great. So it's interesting. Yeah. Works really good. And then um, we are also trying to keep up with our potatoes because uh, they are yes. growing very fast as well. Just pull that picture back up so they can see the yeah, or the yeah, see the so potatoes. All these beds that are down here in the front, uh, those are all potatoes. And they're growing wild right now. It's amazing. When we planted them, we filled smart pots up about halfway and then planted. And now we're trying to keep up with keeping them keeping up with the plants as they go to the top and we're basically at the last round of it now to where the next round of compost we put in there will be the will be the last and then they'll be all the way up to the top so um it won't be too much longer before we're harvesting potatoes it's hard to believe it's already may i'm excited for that so we'll be harvesting potatoes here in about a month or two yeah so that's the kids fun. love harvesting the potatoes it's always so much yeah. fun um but do, been doing a lot of work fertilizing our tomatoes this week and there was a really great video that uh carrie put out this week showing how how we use our fertilizer talking about some tips for tomatoes um so, and we are going to be giving away the Espoma tomato uh, fertilizer. Yeah. I always forget. It's like garden tone tomato fertilizer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're going to be giving away that bag this month. So that is our giveaway this month too. If you missed that, make sure you go check that out. And you can we comment on any of our YouTube videos from the month to enter. That's all you have to do is be subscribed to our channel and comment on any YouTube video from the month. And you are entered to win for each comment. One comment per video. Uh, yep. read full rules and stipulations <laughs> whatever at the blog post it's about as official as I can sound wow um, that, that did sound pretty good I got off to a good start and I didn't know what else to say I'll have to have a script next time <laughs> so anyway a lot of fertilizing tomatoes a lot of trying to keep up with uh, getting everything mulched and uh, trying to because the, the, when we have these heavy rains it causes issues for a plant sometimes because it, all the soil bounces up onto the plant so I'm trying to keep up with Noticing where there's issues and mulching there first, and uh, not Especially enough time around in the day to mulch everything. Too. Yeah, because the tomatoes you don't want the soil to splash up to the leaves because then you have risk for diseases and things like that. So we try and really keep up with those ones. 
which by the way, Carrie covered this and a lot of other great tomato information in her tomato videos this week. So um, check those out because they were, they were really good, really covered uh, our, our thoughts on tomatoes and what we've run into. And um, yeah, so um, most of our tomatoes are determinate because um, the indeterminate tomatoes run wild and it re requires larger trellises. We only have a number of, a couple of those put up so far. But the, the determinate tomatoes grow about three or four feet tall, put out all their tomatoes at once, and you get a lot from it. So we grow a lot of those, a lot of Romas, a lot of San Marzanos, things like that. And the Parks Whopper. Right? Yeah. The Parks Whopper, too. Yeah, that's one of our few indeterminates uh -huh. is that Parks Whopper. It's going to take over an entire cattle panel. I don't know if y'all can see in this picture, like in the middle. It's kind of hard to tell right now, but where the potatoes are, I guess you can't see my cursor, but... Where the potatoes are, that's a big cattle panel trellis, and that will be completely covered with tomatoes here within a few months. So that Parks Whopper is doing amazing. We've got a video about the Parks Whopper talking about that coming out soon as well. Mm -hmm. um, all about just the Parks Whopper variety and the history on it and stuff like that. So uh, stay it's tuned. It's been around forever. It's amazing. Yeah, it's our first year growing it, um, and it's doing really well. It's growing way better than a lot of those heirlooms I tried to grow last year. Like the Cherokee Purple was very difficult to grow yeah. and frustrating. Um, so, all right, well, let's jump into the chat and mm -hmm. answer your questions. So, Andrew, we got some questions. Um, two, yes, unfortunately, it's too late to grow spinach in zone B, but it, believe it or not, you're not too far away from being able to plant it again in the fall. I mean, it's just going to be uh, September, I mean, uh, July and August, whenever we're starting to try and sneak in some of our spinach starts. Uh, probably it's more like it's really got to wait for that heat to completely calm down. Yeah, most of you yeah. are doing it in the shade, but then you're going to... New Zealand spinach, though. You can grow yeah. New Zealand spinach. It's, it's not a real spinach, but you can pretend it is, and it kind of tastes mm -hmm. like it a little bit. It's a good leafy green to have in the summer. So check out New Zealand spinach in Zone B. It's not too late for that. Also, Malabar spinach is a, again, not a real spinach, but uh, it's called that. Um, it climbs up a trellis. It does really well. So check out those two varieties of fake spinach. Um, <laughs> instead of trying to grow real spinach right now in zone B, but definitely try it in the fall in zone B and make sure you get a lot planted in the fall and then let it overwinter because in, especially in zone B, it'll stay alive all winter. And then in the early spring, you will have so much spinach, um, and then plant another round of spinach in the, in the spring and make sure you plant some in an area where it's going to be shaded in the afternoon. That way you have spinach that lasts longer into the summer. So sorry for the bad news, but there's some good news about other things you can plant. Um, snails. snails in the garden. Carrie, you had yes. a battle of snails once when I was out of town. <laughs> I did. It was it was quite fun. You just go. We I had some old beer that he didn't like anymore, and I brought it out to the garden, opened it up, and put it in some shallow little dishes that we had laying around. Poured a little bit of beer around where I had the issues, and the next morning done like it was amazing they couldn't they couldn't resist the beer they hopped in and then <laughs> i guess they drank too much and killed themselves well that's that's how you handle snails yeah straight from Gary. <laughs> so um also if you check out our app in the pest section there is a section for snails and slugs where it talks about some of the stuff as well yeah as well as all other pests um well all the other most common gardening pests. I won't say all other pests. So <laughs> yeah, definitely. But the most common ones you'll run into, and all the ones we've run into for sure. Mm -hmm. So, do we thin our carrots? We we used to thin our carrots, but then we switched to seed tape. Um, seed tape makes it a lot easier because it spaces it out for you. Mm -hmm. Because before I would accidentally drop in like two or three seeds per one, and then yes, definitely you would need to go through and thin your carrots down. It's very important to thin carrots mm -hmm. if you don't get them right from the beginning. Also, the seeding square can make it easier, um, especially if you use some of those little tools that make it where you can do one seed, like the one that there's this little tool we had once where you can like put seeds in it and yeah. it dispenses only one seed at a time. Um, I'm not patient enough for that, and I'm not patient enough to thin. So for us, it's seed tape is the way to go so that's that's what we do with carrots but it is important to thin them for sure first fall garden um okay so for the fall garden if the app has planting dates that is for the fall planting so some of those are going to be for crops that you get um in the fall some of them aren't like garlic you plant in the fall, but then it overwinters and it comes back and you harvest it in the spring. So 
But those planting dates are based on fall. And sometimes like with spinach, you'll plant it in the fall. You'll get a little bit in the fall and then it'll go dormant. But then it really comes back alive in the spring. So the way you know whether or not it'll come back alive is you look at the, uh, there's two different fields. There's perennial, there, there's uh, the field that's tight. Basically it's cool season, warm season, or perennial. And then there's also one for frost hardiness. So if it's, if it says survives hard frost and it's a perennial, then that means it should, or it, it should, should come back. Um, and a lot of times, like with the herbs and things like that, there's fall planting dates and those are perennial. I mean, technically you could plant them in the summer, but it's harder because you got to keep them watered really well, depending on your climate. So, um, but if the dates are there, that is the recommended date based on that plant. So if you look at the seed packet, it'll say something like two to four weeks before last spring frost or two to four weeks before first fall frost or things like that. That's the data that we use to calculate our planting dates is based off of that relative to your predicted frost date based on your nearest weather station's data. Thrips. We have not had to deal with thrips, so I don't know off the top of my that. head. You know what? I actually... There was something I was, one of the plants I was talking about was the yellow, said was something. The insect tra traps, the yellow sticky traps. I think it's that. Do we have? Yeah, we have thrips yeah. in here. Because there was something I know. I I made a video and one of the plants that I was talking about, one of the really good companions helped with thrips. I, re I, I can't remember which one it was now though. Blue sticky traps help with thrips apparently. So not the yellow, the blue. Um, neem oil is also another thing that's recommended, although make sure you don't do that if the temperature is above 90. Um, and then also, um, yeah, I need to have it where I can just pull the app up on this live stream. And show I know. This. Yeah, because I'm just pulling up our app. Here, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> right that's here. That's what I'm doing. Everything you need to know about thrips right there. So uh, <laughs> the blue insect traps are what I would try. Um, you might try some yellow too. I, we don't have thrips enough for me to experiment with that, but I'd be curious to see how the yellow performed to, with the blue. But Hopefully that helps you echo the cat. Okay, so when potatoes are ready to harvest, they will start to die back. I mean, technically you can harvest them at any time. Um, but when they start to die back, that's whenever you we really go through and harvest them all. But we'll start sneaking some potatoes out. I might start that here pretty soon, actually. Just kind of... Um, Checking them out. Especially in the, in the smart pots where I know that we may have overplanted a little bit accidentally. Um, so when we let the kids help, sometimes they get a little eager. So sometimes we end up with way more potatoes. So on those ones are the ones that I'm harvesting more out of earlier on. Whereas the ones that are planted correctly, I'm going to let those produce some larger uh, potatoes. It's fine. I would love to have the problem of having more and too much. Then we are going to have that problem. This <laughs> we're going to have more potatoes this year than we've ever had. Oh, I'm is... so excited. And that one year we had a huge tub. Yeah. 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 This is going to be our best year potato year. We've. Traditionally, I haven't done great at fertilizing potatoes, but this year we've done a really good job of keeping up with fertilizing and composting Compost, and all of that. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited. They look better than they ever have. I think part of it is just the really big smart pots too, because mm -hmm. every big smart pot that we have right now has a potato in it. I think there's a couple Pretty of Pretty much. We have a couple. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Whoa. That's, that's cool. awesome. Okay. Good perennials that are low maintenance. Um, are you talking, um, that's, so let's talk some food and let's also talk some flowers and stuff too. Um, rosemary. so for rosemary, oregano, thyme, sage, sage is beautiful. It makes these beautiful flowers in, in June here. Especially pineapple sage. I love pineapple, pineapple sage. sage is great. So and we'll attack, uh, attack, <laughs> attract, attract. <laughs> the, the, what's that butterfly? The, uh, the, the, the hummingbird moth. Yeah. The hummingbird yeah. moth. Yeah. Um, those are some great perennials. Um, you know, things like berry bushes are pretty easy depending on what it is. Like a blackberry is going to grow pretty out of control. That's going to take some upkeep, but a blueberry isn't going to grow. Uh, it's going to grow like more as a bush. Um, I think, you know, fruit trees, um, things like that are also great options from the flower perspective. Gary, you want to throw your input on perennials on that side? We're mostly doing annuals, I but know. or yeah. self-seeding annuals like zinnias are great because those are going to come back on their own. Yeah. Um, you can also do that with cilantro where you let it bolt and have an area where it's just kind of cilantro and it comes back. Um, what else? Is there anything else? There's the perennial, well, the perennial vining stuff we've used a lot. Um, 
Forgot the name of it though. <laughs> the, pe- the one we had on our back porch at the old house that was up against that trellis. Oh, the uh, oh the purple pea thing. Yeah, the the no. ones that look the beans. No, no, it was the other one. Darn, I can't think now. <laughs> well, we threw out some suggestions. I don't know. Good luck. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, Japanese beetles. So um, here in Oklahoma, I mean, you, just growing up, they've been everywhere my whole life. Uh, they are called June bugs around here because they come out in June. Um, the best way to handle them is with this um, product called Milky Spore. It's a naturally occurring soil bacteria that comes from Japan. And um, you basically, it's just a big bag of this white powder and you put it in your soil and it lasts 15 to 30 years. Um, well, here, so they mentioned Japanese beetle, but then they said a fez- fuzzy yellow bug that looked like a ladybug. So that's not, that's a, not a Japanese ja- yeah, that's, beetle. I stopped on the Japanese yeah, beetle part. Yeah, so I that, that's why I, I saw that part and I was like, so yellow that looks like a ladybug. Is that cucumber like cucumber beetle? beetle? That's probably cucumber beetle. That, that's what it sounds like. Yes. They're not fuzzy, really. They're not fuzzy, but they're yellow and they look like ladybugs. Yes. So, so. if it's cucumber beetles, there's cucumber traps, you, there's cucumber beetle traps you can build. We have a video that shows that. Check out our YouTube Yeah, super easy and it worked really well. Yep. Um, there's the also traps. pheromone traps you can buy for cucumber beetles. They're difficult, though. Uh, you don't want to let them get out of hand. Try and, try and trap them or try and like, hand pick them. We do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, they, they can be a menace because they carry disease. So you don't want to let them get out of hand. Okay, so yeah, I think what you've already called it. They're getting too much water. Um Did you, I guess you already planted them in the ground. Um, I, you know, we, we plant primarily in smart pots with our peppers for this reason, because a lot of times in May we're getting a lot of rain and a lot our plants will have this issue and those smart pots drain really well. Um, one thing we have done too is take those five gallon water jugs and cut the top of it. As long as the temperatures aren't too hot, you can put that on during one of your big heavy storms and it should protect it from getting too much water on the inside of that too. yeah that's that's a good tip good advice there yeah it's it's a struggle though um yeah. so just whenever it cool whenever it dries up a little bit hit them with some nitrogens and fish fertilizer because it could be a sign of, of low nitrogen the leaves turning yellow but it's probably too much water so um you can use wood chips as mulch um Im- Im- immediately uh, if you're using them around your plants one of the concerns is that they can leach nitrogen from the soil so typically what we'll do is we'll mix a little bit of compost or put compost down before the wood chips so that there's a layer there where there's plenty of nitrogen to go around for everybody and they're not stealing from my plants. Um, but we'll use wood chips uh, immediately. Like we'll get a giant w- a load of wood chips delivered and then I'll put them all around our, our gardens. Typically, I'm trying to use different mulches within the garden. Uh, leaf mulch, just leaves are my favorite or pine shavings that have been taken out of the rabbit area or something like that. Mm-hmm. I like to use that kind of stuff for my mulch around the plants instead of wood chips, but you can use them immediately if you have them. Grubs. grubs yeah. yeah, so, get the, so so the grubs are not always, but for us, grubs mean Japanese beetles. So in, in moles, so the problem with them is they will feed on your plants quite a bit too. So they can be very destructive to your plants. Also, they will attract moles like you're finding. Um, the milky spore is the best way to handle them uh, or get a bunch of chickens. That's what we've done. And they've yes. been... The chickens love to gobble those up. They love chasing the uh, June bugs. So put a light out and then uh, the chickens will... Yeah. Well, they, they love the grubs. Because they're like huge oh, yeah. worms, all they just oh they go crazy for them. They fight over them. Yeah, but milky spore if you don't want to get chickens. <laughs> <laughs> um, asparagus should be pretty simple. Um, it'll come back year after year. Um, we haven't. Uh, we we planted asparagus in our old garden, and then we moved before we were able to yeah. harvest from it. So we have some asparagus now. We haven't planted it here yet, but it's a perennial, and it should come back year after year. I haven't grown it enough to give you personal experience from it, but definitely check it out in the app because we'll have everything we found from research will be in the app about asparagus. 
Yeah, Cherokee tomatoes. They're we've had the same thing. When you get tomatoes from them, they're worth it because they're amazing. But it's just it's difficult. And it's definitely not one I'd recommend for a beginner. Not that you are, but when we were, we tried. That was one of our first ones we tried, and I kind of based my tomato my tomato opinions on that. But some of the other varieties we tried, like the Parks Whopper, the Celebrity, and some of these other ones, like they've done really well. So, uh, so the, what we've learned with tomatoes is try and choose d- disease resistant tomatoes. Make sure we're mulching really well, and check out Carrie's video for the rest of the tips. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good segue, wasn't it? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sweet peas. Okay, so I need to clarify if you're talking about sweet pea the flower or peas the pea. If they are sweet peas the flower, I don't know. Do you know anything about sweet peas the flower? Uh, we've grown them like once. So that's about it. That's about all. If they are peas the vegetable, then on those, we always start those outside. They don't typically transplant very well. Um, but if you've already start them and started them inside, then yes, definitely go ahead and get them out. We're planting our peas whenever it's still... We plant our peas in the snow. We did, yeah. Carrie, Carrie wore a pea costume for that one, <laughs> and there's a video for you. I want you to go check that one out. Yeah, I was with the kids. We did dress up that day, and we all dressed up as peas and carrots, and we did some planting in the snow in the garden. Yep. Check that one out. But... <laughs> Leaf miners, so that's going to be another one where the yellow sticky traps have worked well for us in the past. We've always picked those up. Um, So that's what I would recommend for leaf miners. Well, thank you, first of all. That's awesome. The ground cherries. Um, So ground cherries are going to fall in the same category as tomatoes and peppers where you want to use a heat mat with those when you're germinating them. So that's the number one tip I can give for those is to use a heat mat. And then uh, we've had a lot of great success with our biodome, getting things to germinate because it keeps the humidity at the right level. So check out check out the biodome. You can also save 15% on the biodome if you use our, uh, our code. We have a code SPOON15 that you can use in the Park Seed Store. And maybe Andrew can throw that code up for a second so y'all can see that. But Spoon 15 will save you 15% on any purchase, uh, including those biodomes. So I definitely recommend checking out uh, the biodome or or something like that um, for the seed starting. Um, Gnats on seedlings. So uh, Carrie has some really good videos from the spring where we talked about some of this. But the main tips that we talked about in those videos were to use a fan because that airflow will make it more difficult for the gnats to be able to fly and they're, it's just it's going to disrupt their system. So that's one thing we do a, a lot of. Also make sure you're not overwatering. So make sure that you're not having plants that are sitting in water all the time. That can contribute to having gnats and things like that. Um, there's also a, a spray that we used from a Spoma. It was a Spoma mm-hmm. spray that worked really well. Um, that we, it's pretty much the only time I use a spray is indoors. Otherwise I'm letting ladybugs or other insects help me out and handle it. But, um, in the seed, in the indoors, we, we have to, you know, take control and use sprays sometimes. And that Espoma organic spray is, is one we have a lot of success with. So check that out. And make sure you're only watering from the bottom also, and not watering from the top whenever you're doing that. Um, New Zealand spinach is notorious for being difficult to germinate. And I've had so many times where I've planted it and then just thought, well, I guess that didn't germinate. And then I come back a few months later and it's hiding under a squash plant or something. <laughs> um, so it, I've learned it does take, you know, up to 21 days to germinate. Another thing, I, so this is one that I would do indoors and do like on a heat mat because, again, it will germinate much faster. It's kind of like uh, tomatoes and peppers in that way where it germinates much faster on a heat mat. Um, where you are now in zone B... It's probably warm enough just to put it directly outside and not have to fool with um, with doing it indoors. But um, next year, you might consider starting it indoors in early April, somewhere along that time. And then you can transplant it outside whenever you're past your first freeze. But um, it definitely is notorious for being difficult to germinate. It's um, But it just takes a while. It's you know, up to two to three weeks for it to germinate. Uh, so when spinach is done for the season, it will uh, develop a, uh, it'll bolt basically, where it'll develop a, a center stalk, and then that center stalk will start to produce seed. The leaves will start to shrivel up, and they will not taste as good, and you will know when it's done. It, 
it'll be very obvious. So we're probably getting really close to that point here in Oklahoma. Um, if it's getting some shade in the afternoon, then it may hang on through mid through May. But as soon as we start to hit those 80s and 90s, and we're already hitting them every now and then, but they will uh, this they will next bolt. week. We will be so yeah. So um, probably... just try and give them a lot of extra water to help cool them down, keep them in the shade in the afternoon, and you could also move them indoors and try and nurse them along as best you can. So spinach, um, so I, I talked a lot about spinach earlier, and then I think the, the one key from that I want, I want to bring up again is, is the timing of it, of make sure you have a fall crop that goes in first that you plant and then overwinters. Uh, and this is probably applies to anyone in f zone five or below. Maybe you can do this higher than that. I'm not sure. Um, but I know I've seen people in zone five do it. And, um, well, Elliot Coleman does it in Vermont too. He, he used covers and things like that, but. Um, but it can be done pretty much across the country, I think, for the most part, um, to overwinter spinach. So you, you plant, um, so, so with overwintering, what you do is you plant in the fall and then you just leave it alone over the winter and then it'll go dormant. And, and then in the spring, it'll come back alive and it'll be one of your first plants to start to put out new seeds. So that's what we mean by, by overwintering is just let it let it chill over the winter. Don't dig it up. Don't mess with it. Just let it let it last over the winter. Um, people also say overwintering inside, so that um, if you take a pepper and you move it indoors in the in the winter, that's overwintering in a in a garage or something like that. Our favorite things to plant in the fall: uh, spinach is number one. Kale is a close second. Lettuce. Swiss chard is always my favorite. Yeah, carrots beets um turnips yeah we i like a lot of the root crops Peas because they too. just they taste so much sweeter i feel like whenever you harvest them when it's cold out yeah and i i love i love growing carrots in the fall that's probably one of my favorites and then of course swiss chard yeah it's the same with spinach and kale in the yeah. winter the leaves produce sugar to help keep them from freezing so it makes everything taste much sweeter uh, so i love cilantro in the fall as well I just, uh, fall is my favorite time to grow. Everything tastes better. There's fewer bugs. There's fewer weeds. Uh, there's no more Bermuda really around here, which is our main nemesis for weeds. So it's just a much better time for us to grow. Peas also do really well in the fall. We plant a lot of those as well. And sometimes you can still sneak in tomatoes and things like that in the fall where we'll have tomatoes that we're still planting in July and August. Um, and then, um, you know, those are producing in, in the fall too. So... I guess technically August is the fall. I don't know. Is it... Oh, I don't know when the uh, yeah. fall officially starts. <laughs> um, well, Mr. you're welcome, Nancy. Stripey. Um, Mr. Stripey. I don't know anything about Mr. Stripey. It sounds cool, though. <laughs> it does sound pretty cool. Um, I, but I think just our tomato tips in general will apply to Mr. Stripey. <laughs> um, so make sure you keep the, the leaves off the ground. Make sure you keep it mulched. Make sure you're giving it fertilizer, um, not too much nitrogen because then it'll produce too much green. Um, make sure you're using companion plants like basil around your uh, your tomatoes too. Um, to uh, basil, oregano, thyme, marigolds, all these things are great companions. She had a video the other day that talks about the best five companions yeah, for our, tomatoes. Our favorite ones. I think I only said four, so you'll have to find out what the last one is oh, in the video. Did you say nasturtium? Now you told them. Now oh. they don't have to watch the video. Sorry. I'm... Uh, mar marketing <laughs> manager. <laughs> My goodness. Well, now you know. Now they know. Now they know. But they want to find out why, though, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Because I talk all about why they're great and, and how they help. And what nasturtium is, because we didn't know what nasturtium even was before we started gardening. Yep. It's a flower you can eat that grows well in the summer. So, yeah. Marigolds you can eat, too, though. Lots of flowers you can eat. Anything in our app you can eat. That's our, that's our, people ask a lot, a lot, like, how do you decide what to put in the app? Well, it's things, things you can eat or that's our line right now, pretty much. <laughs> um, strawberry seeds from strawberry from the store. That's cool. Um, I would probably, I mean, you can keep trying, but there's no telling what you're going to get from that. It could be a hybrid seed or something like that. Um, I don't know. Just I mean, I, I would keep trying just because I like doing experiments like that. But if I were serious about planting strawberries, what I would do is go 
Um, oh, the strawberry sale just ended at Park Seed. They had Did a strawberry it? seed last week. It ended. Well, you can buy strawberries through, and that's a really cheap way to buy them, actually, is through Park Seed. You can get a bundle of... 20. 20. For 17.95? There you go. Yeah, that is right. Yeah, so for, for less than a dollar, a strawberry plant. You Plus get, our 15% off code. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a really cheap way to do strawberries. They'll be bare root. They'll be tiny little plants, but you can put them in something like a biodome, and then you can start them out from there. Uh, we've you also, can plant them directly, too. Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, we've also, like, typically what we do with, with strawberries is we're buying a bunch of transplants from, like, our our local favorite nursery. Always has them for, like, two fifty a piece. So we'll go in there and just get a couple trays of strawberries and plant them everywhere. Um, we love to fill up. Like, we have a giant smart pot type fabric raised bed that's, like, 300 gallons. And we fill the entire thing with, smart, with strawberries. That's one of our favorite things to grow. So... Hopefully that helps you out with strawberries. Um, so with cherry tomatoes, you can just plant those extra deep. So you don't need to prune them. Um, just whenever you plant them, uh, peel off. Like just, we'll just basically plant them extra deep until. Um, and yeah, then just make sure the leaves, like if there's any leaves touching the ground or anything, you just pull those off. Tomatoes are one of the few plants that you can plant deep and it's fine. Because the little hairs that are on tomatoes plants will become roots when they're whenever they're underground. So actually uh, do better. Do yeah, it it's, it's actually like recommended deeper, to yeah. do that. So sometimes a leggy tomato plant isn't as bad um, if it's indeterminate. If it's a determinate, it can be like aroma. You don't want leggy aromas, but um, leggy indeterminates are usually usually fine. Um, I don't know. Asian beetle. I don't know. Is it in our app? Not just Asian Beetle. No, I don't know. Not that one. Sorry. Maybe somebody else in, yeah. in the chat will have an answer that what they've dealt with it before. Hornworms. <laughs> <laughs> Stop getting slugs drunk. <laughs> um, hornworms and fruit trees. So, tomato hornworms... Uh, the best thing to do is just to handpick those off. Or do companion planting. To keep them away. Yeah. Hint, my video that I made, <laughs> that top five companion plants for, for tomatoes, a lot of them had to deal with hornworms. Yeah. There, there is a treatment you can do as well. Um, there's this thing called BTK Caterpillar Killer that is completely organic and it works on pretty much all caterpillars. So you could spray that too. And I would do that for both fruit worms and for the tomato horn worms. Um, there's probably something else out there for fruit worms for trees. I haven't dealt with that too much, um, but I think we have it in the app. I'd have to look. Yes. And I, I would reuse soil from the previous year because that soil hopefully has life in it from the previous year. So what you want to do is use your soil mix from the previous year, but then add compost into it every season. So every spring we're adding compost and then we're adding for some plants, we're adding compost every couple of weeks and then every fall we're adding compost. So we're just rejuvenating that soil with compost every time we plant basically. Mexican beetles. Huh. So it wasn't the cucumber beetle? Oh, well, Mex bean beetle. Mexican bean beetle? We have that in the app. Oh, hold on. We do have that in the app. I remember that. Let's see. Yeah, Mexican bean beetle. There it is. There it is. Yes. Yeah, and it says Mexican bean beetles look very similar to ladybugs. Yes. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> we're Mexican real high beetles. tech we yeah, are that's how we do screen sharing so hand picking and placing the beetles in soapy water um companion planting is a big deal with uh with um keeping them away too so i would throw a lot of herbs um insect netting can help with them and then yellow sticky traps have i've shown to be beneficial as well um so that's that's what you can do for but i think hand picking is probably going to be there if they're probably somewhere to cucumber beetles in that way where that's going to be the best way, um, and, or the yellow sticky traps, or, um, you know, the, the, the essence of that cucumber beetle trap is you take a yellow solo cup and you just cover it in sticky glue 
And then the yellow cello cups look like a squash flower that's open. So the cucumber beetles are attracted to squash. So they're, so they go to that. So what I would do is look for a, a solo cup that's the same color as the flowers on the plant that they're hitting. So that bean flower that you have or some sort of something that's the same color as that and then do a sticky trap on it. So that's what I would do is whatever f color flower they're targeting, I would make a trap that matches that. And then also something you can do is take some of those flowers that they're targeting, put them in the trap so that we've got some of the smell of it too. We've done that in the past, or we've done like clove essential oil or different flowery essential oils that's, att that's attracted them. We just put the essential oil on a cotton swab and put it inside that cello cup and then just glue it in there, basically. Sweet potatoes. Um, so with those, we do grow the slips out. So basically all you do is you take a sweet potato that you're going to grow, whether it's from a store or one that you've bought, and then you sit it in some a uh, little like cup with some water, and then it'll start to grow little shoots off of it. And you take those and you, and you plant those out. So that's the way that we've done. It's not like it is with potatoes. Uh, it's different where you have to grow those shoots out. So that's what we that's what we do with sweet potatoes. Um, it could be because of the soil. Um. I would start there. I mean, I would definitely have a, spaghetti squash is going to like soil that's rich in, in, in nutrients. So I would make sure you're using a lot of compost um, whenever you're planting your spaghetti squash. But typically it's something that grows really, really well for us. The biggest issue we run into is squash bugs. They will kill it in a hurry. Um, that could be what's going on where you have either a squash bugs that are killing it or a squash vine borer. If it's uh, if it just stops growing and there's no evidence of anything, that's more likely the squash bug. But if it if you go to the base of the plant and it looks all mushy and it kind of breaks off easily, that's evidence of a squash vine borer. Borer. Um, those are the two things I would think of first for just like sudden stopping of that because traditionally, I mean, like even in areas we've grown, uh, we've grown squash where the soil isn't the greatest, it at least grows for until it starts to put on fruit and then you notice it doesn't put on fruit as well or then it starts to struggle so typically if they're early like that it's not going to be as much of, an, of a deficiency unless it's just really bad um but i would look for the pest to be the issue um okra i suggest doing in the ground it's one of the few things that we grow just right in the ground, not even a raised bed or, or anything like that, because typically it's growing in the summer when there's way less uh, rain here in Oklahoma. So um, I'm not as worried about it being flooded out and it grows really well here, just right in, in the ground. Now, the one tip on, on okra, I will say, is to make sure you're not starting it too early because it does like the heat. So we're not even planting our okra until maybe here in the next few weeks we'll start. But I want to see nighttime temperatures above 60 uh, every single night in the forecast before I'm planting okra. Um, and I will say, make sure that you keep up with harvesting your okra because it'll slow down if you leave the okra on the plant for too long. So don't let them go get really big. So try to pick them when they're small and then they'll keep reproducing. And they taste way better when they're small too. Once mm -hmm. they get really big, now you've got to start like uh, cooking them longer, or cooking them soups or things like that. Yeah. Whenever they're small, you can just snack on them straight in the garden. Yeah, they're I, good. I love doing that. Just raw right out of the garden. It's so good. Now I'm excited to plant some okra. I know. I want, I want okra now. <laughs> Too late to plant summer crops. Uh, well, I don't know where you are, but you should be should be fine pretty much everywhere. I guess if you're still down like if you're down like in south florida or something maybe it's different but well you, yeah depending on where you are check the app the can be planted filter on that main screen if you pull that up it'll show you the things that you can still plant so that way it'll give you a better answer than we can guessing because we don't know where you are yep that's why we built our app though to yep. calculate that for you so yep. check Make it out it easier Best fruit and veggies to grow in grow bags in Texas. Um, you're going to have a lot of success with blackberries and raspberries and um, apples, probably. Uh, probably, uh, definitely peaches. Um, 
I mean, assuming I mean, it's, I think anywhere in Texas, unless you're in the panhandle, but anywhere south of Oklahoma, I think you'll be fine growing peaches even. Um, pears will do well. I don't know how they'll do in grow bags as well. They, they like to get bigger. Um, things like limes and lemons, you'll have to bring indoors in the winter more than likely, unless you're really far south Texas. Um, but blueberries should do really well for you as well. Make sure you add a soil acidifier into the grow bag with the, with the blueberry because it likes some more acidic, a more acidic soil. Um, what other strawberries? That's probably a little late to get, uh, you can still sneak them in. Just keep them really watered for a while. Um, and then they get afternoon shade. Yeah. And go with an ever bearing variety instead of a June bearing. That way you still get some this year and you don't have to wait till next Cause I don't know if you're going to get very many out of a June bearing right now. If you plant them, you wouldn't really, it's just, it's not going to be as productive as if you do an ever bearing. I think you'll get more in the fall. Um, so we do thin down our tomatoes to only one per, uh, per place that we're planting a tomato. Um, on our determinate tomatoes, we do not prune at all on our indeterminate tomatoes, the vining tomatoes, I try not to. I try not to get myself in a position where I have to prune. I like to give the tomato enough room where it can just run wild, and I don't have to prune because I, I'm a lazy gardener and I don't like doing it. Um, but if it gets out of hand, sometimes I have to prune some suckers. So um, we need to make a video about that. I guess once we start running into that problem, we'll make that video. Yeah. So. Um, well, the first tip is to add soil acidifier. Um, make sure they're getting plenty of water in the beginning. Um, make sure you're using a large enough, uh, smart pot if you're growing in a smart pot or something like that, but, um, make sure you're not doing, I, I would do a, I mean, a soil test also, um, you may have like a super alkaline soil or something like that. That could be what's going on, but the soil acidifier should help. And if you just grow like a. That, that's why like with blueberries especially I, I don't think i would ever grow any in the ground where i live because we have very alkaline soil um so those especially i'm going to grow in a really big smart pot like a 20 25 gallon with handles um one that takes two people to move and a big cart like a, a big one but it's worth it for a bunch of blueberries so that's that's what i would do and that way you can control the ph a little better in that contained environment Um, it just depends on, on where you live. Um, again, the, our app will calculate this for you based on, on where you live. So if you, um, if you check it out, then you can see fall planting dates for all the plants in our app. Moles and voles are a challenge. We have yeah. fought them quite a bit. Um, moles, not as much, more voles which are basically just mice that go underground and have really big teeth. Um, <laughs> They're nasty. I mean, the, the best way to handle them is the old fashioned way. And some people don't like this, but mouse traps work really well. So I'll leave it at that. There's Google mouse traps. There's a lot of different ways you can do that, but they do work well for voles. Um, if you don't want to do, if you don't want to go that route, you can try protecting your raised beds by putting hardware cloth underneath of them. That should keep them from tr from tunneling under, but sometimes it doesn't matter, um, especially with like peppers. Like they'll eat pepper plants quite a bit. They'll uh, our melons always get wrecked from them. Um, so we end up getting a lot of cats too. Uh, this is why we started getting cats, and then Carrie fell in love with cats, and then now we have a lot of cats. <laughs> so, but that was why it started was to help with 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 them with keeping voles under control. So well, there's also those like sonic things that you can put in the ground to the the sonic pest repellers. Repel them. It helps, but it like annoys me too. Yeah. So it like repels me also. We've done something like we had a bucket one time where like the mouse would like run up over top and then they'd get stuck in it or something like that. Yeah. Like we would make our own too. Like there's yeah. So if you don't want to do like an old fashioned mouse trap, there's like yeah. There's traps no kill mouse traps, and then you, you can, can make yeah yeah. So this depends on the tomato type. If it's a determinate, I'm not removing any of it. If it's an indeterminate, then if we want, if we need to prune it, like maybe if our trellis is not big enough to be able to handle the full size of that tomato, 
then what we where we will prune is, is where it's called the sucker. So it's, it's, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but if you have like a main stem and then you have a leaf stem coming off of it, there'll be a new growth in between there. Um, I need a better diagram for something. We'll make a video on it. But <laughs> if you search on, on, I don't think we have a video talking about this, but I'm sure someone does. Just search for tomato sucker pruning and you'll see a picture yeah. of it. As soon as um, as soon as we have some issues with it, we'll I'll pop a video of it. Of it. I would not recommend doing that. Um, I'm, but I'm I'm on one side of the spectrum on this argument. So I mean, I think there's other people that would say it may be fine, but the whole point of why I'm doing a lot of this is to avoid a lot of the chemicals and things like that in my food. So. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't do that. I think a better area, that a better thing you can do, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm recommending you to play with fire because that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, our propane torch is awesome for this. So um, that's what we use to kill weeds and stuff to, to build a new garden area. Or you can all... Oh, oh yeah. I was going to say you can also use like cardboard, just lay layers of cardboard down, put some wood chips on top of that, and it'll kill all of the grass and weeds too. We found the the black fabric weed that it, it didn't do much of anything for us. So, but but that cardboard really worked well. Yep. Uh, you can also uh, do a black plastic that you cover the ground with, and then leave it down for a few months in the summer. And the heat from from the sun will basically just cook that whole area and kill the weeds and kill the pests and everything in that area as well. So if you're wanting to kill an area in order to make garden beds that's what i recommend doing but if you're wanting to like just weed an area between paths and stuff like that that's when i'm using the the tort the propane torch and all that and having fun mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't know what that is do you know what that black is? black print snaps i i don't yeah i'm sorry but i love your username time girl <laughs> But I'm sorry, I don't know I what like that, that is. This is a common mistake. Um, we've done this as well, where we start our tomatoes uh, too soon, and then I get excited. Yeah, <laughs> well, that we plant our tomatoes in rounds, so it ends up working out because the ones that we plant later on end up. Are we frozen? And okay, it's doing that again, where we look frozen on the screen, but yeah. we're probably not actually really frozen. <laughs> Andrew, can you tell us in the chat if we're really frozen, please? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, he we're said good. we're all good. We just get to look at this dumb look on my face now for the next three minutes again. <laughs> <laughs> this happened last time. It, it was a worse <laughs> picture last time, at least. It's not as bad this time. <laughs> okay, so um, hold on. Go back to that last question, Andrew. Um, okay, so how deep can you plant them when you get them out? You can plant them very deep. I mean, like eight six to eight inches a lot of times what i'll do instead of planting that deep though is i'll i'll make i'll kind of make a area in the soil that looks kind of like this and then i'll lay the tomato to where the root ball is maybe right here and then it's like coming up here and then i kind of shape it so it's coming up so instead of it going all the way down deep it's more of like being like that and going up so that's what i would do with the tomato um is plant it that way We have not grown uh, very many roses, so unfortunately, I cannot tell you very much about roses. I'm sorry, Vivian. Yeah, we've only had that one one arch that we had of roses. Yeah, they were very pretty. But it's something we're going to be growing a lot of very yes. soon. Um, so stay tuned on that. Persimmon tree. So we haven't grown persimmon. I don't know how well it's going to handle being in a container. Um, and I don't know, I haven't really heard of too many people growing them in a container either. So I will say I've seen some pretty large trees grown in the large smart pots, like especially in those 25 gallons with handles. I mean, some pretty large trees will grow in that. So it does it's say worth the shot. It's round smart pot, so it's probably yeah. like a 25 or 30. Yeah. Oh, snapdragons. We've grown snapdragons before. I didn't know they were poisonous. Do you remember what the... Okay, Andrew's got the other question here. You're on. Awesome. Good job, Andrew. Um, okay. No. 
No, your lettuce won't be uh, contaminated from having that in the same. Um, you, you you should be fine with that. So, I, I would I wouldn't worry about it. Um, squash, squash bugs, bugs are very difficult. Our nemesis. Yes, they are. Um, the pests we have the most difficulty with here in Oklahoma. And our strategy for squash bugs, well, sit down for a minute because it's going to take a little bit to explain. <laughs> so, um, and it may sound a little outlandish, but I mean, it, this is what we got to do for squash bugs. This is literally what we do. Is we start by planting a trap crop of squash varieties that squash bugs are very attracted to. Blue Hubbard is one of these. Uh, we'll plant it earlier in the season and... Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll wait for all the squash bugs that overwintered to, to be attracted to that squash plant, to start to gather that squash plant. And as soon as I start to see life that's happening around that squash plant where I'm seeing squash bugs, um, I don't want to let them, I don't want to let them go all the way to being able to start laying eggs. I want to get it at the, I want to catch them at the prime stage where they're already kind of first gathering there. And then what I'll do is I'll get a really big fire going and I'll throw that squash plant into the fire. And hopefully get them all. And then I'll come back behind where that squash plant was. Make sure like I've got everything handled there and, and killed and uh, propane torch and all of that. Um, if you can't do a fire, which I know a lot of places can't, uh, you can just chop it at the base too and put it in like some sort of like airtight. So like if it'll fit in a Ziploc baggie, great. If not, just like double bag, tr double, triple bag it. Put it away in the trash can far away. Yeah. So, I mean, then I think what I'm trying to say is prevention is the key, is trying to catch them early, too. Yeah, and companion planting also. Um, I made a video, I posted it actually a couple days ago, about the top five, and plus the bonus tip that, that we may have already said. <laughs> um, but I made a, a video about all the companions, and a lot of those help with squash bugs too so check that out also and then also grow squash vertically um grow it up a so what we'll do is we'll plant it next to a t-post and then as the squash grows we'll attach it to the t-post so it grows up vertically and then the leaves being up off the ground will make it harder for the squash bugs so those are the main main tips we have for how to handle handle squash bugs Yeah, marigolds and basil are fantastic companion plants for, for those. Some other great companion plants that we use throughout our garden are um, some other herbs uh, like oregano and rosemary and sage and thyme. And the reason why a lot of these herbs work so well is because, and one of the aspects of companion planting, there's several aspects of it, but one of the big ones is camouflaging your plants with other plants that have strong scents. So a lot of times pests will find what they're looking for through their sense of smell. And if you have a tomato plant that is surrounded by oregano, then, or basil, and, or all these different herbs, then it's harder for the tomato hornworm to find the tomato plant because there's all these other scents in the air that are, that are camouflaging your tomato. So that's one aspect of companion planting. There's other, other aspects of companion planting too where um you know you can plant beans before you plant something that's a heavy feeder because beans add nitrogen into the soil and, and different things like that but you know with companion planting our app was built so that um it, it makes it easy to know which companions go with with each other so um in the companion section for each plant, it'll show you both the friends and the enemies for each plant. So it'll show you what grows well together, what doesn't grow well together. A big focus of Carrie on uh, that she's been doing on YouTube the past few weeks is making videos all about companion planting. So she has a video about tomato companions, about their about the best companions for tomatoes and why each of them is a good companion. Um, she just made one about squash mm -hmm. and we'll be making a lot more videos about companion plants. So um, stay tuned for that. And if there's anything specific that you all would like to see us make a video about uh, a plant, you know, a plant that you want to definitely know about companions or a plant that you want to know more about why it's a good companion or something like that. Let us know because we want to, we want to make a lot of content about that. So um, 
I guess we have a question that was posted that is not showing up in the stream, so Andrew can't pull it up. So I'm just going to read off uh, what it is. Do you recommend a place to buy fruit trees in Oklahoma or one that has trees that are acclimated to this area? So I think you're on the right track by trying to buy fruit trees local. Um, that is typically what we do is we try and find nurseries that have um, tr varieties that have been that are grown here and not just ones that are shipped in from California or something like that. It's where they just came in a few weeks ago. I'm looking for, for varieties of trees that grew up around me, basically. Um, I don't have a great recommendation for Oklahoma for, for trees. Typically what we're doing is I'm just nursery hopping. Uh, Carrie and I will have a, a date day mm -hmm. where we will just go from nursery to nursery and just Getting the best looking ones. And yeah. And you know, and, um, if anyone has a recommendation of a place that you can go to in Oklahoma to buy a bunch of uh, trees like that, let me know. Uh, we also have been experimenting more with um, ordering trees online. We actually sell them through our app, Park Seed Carries Trees. So for uh, for things like limes or lemons, where I'm not as concerned about an Oklahoma-specific variety because it's going indoors in the winter anyway, um, those are great options are, are to buy those online. Um, and you can you say can... 15% too, <laughs> in case yeah. you missed it, with the, the code SPOON15. So if you put that in, you get 15% off your entire order. Yeah, typically with a lot of plants too, I, I, I like to shop at um, farmer's markets, places like that. But typically you're not going to find very many trees at a farmer's market. So um Uh, how do you get the squash to go vertically? So, yes, what you've got to do is you put a T-post in the ground right next to it. And it does grow more like a bush, but you can train it to grow up that T-post. So you you want to make sure you do this as the squash plant grows. If you do it, if you wait too late and you try and take a mature squash plant that's already a couple feet long and then tie it up to the T-post, you can break it easily. So you want to keep up with it and just use a little bit of like that green flexible tape or garden twine or something like that to tie it up to the T-posts. And then that's all there is to it. Most nutrient dense plants to plant in mid Michigan. Okay. I don't know. Like let's just talk about nutrient dense plants necessarily. Broccoli is very nutrient dense because you can eat any part of the plant. So some plants, um, you know, like for peppers, for example, you can only eat the, eat the peppers that are produced. Now, peppers are going to produce a lot of peppers. So that's probably a good one to talk about, too, is you're going to get. And there's a study that I actually read about this morning um, about um, peppers being a preventative for cancer. Now, they're, they're starting to have studies that are proving some of these theories about the chemicals that are in peppers and how they can help prevent cancer. So um, peppers, uh, I, would, I would definitely go with with that as an answer. But back to the answer I was giving before, which was, what was the one I was talking about before now. No, I forgot. Broccoli. Broccoli. Uh, you know, the entire plant is edible. So the leaves are edible. The broccoli heads are edible. It's in, uh, a lot of a lot of nutrients in it. Uh, and microgreens. Microgreens are yeah. a great solution there. Yeah. Um, kale also is very nutrient dense. Has a lot of magnesium in it, which uh, is important for uh, for a lot of different things. Um, what are some other plants we grow? We get a lot of fruit food from it. Um, you know, something like a carrot, you only get yeah. one carrot from seed. Beans and peas, you get a lot of uh, production from those as well. And uh, beans and peas are, are one of the rare forms of protein that you can get from the garden as well. So that's a, a good thing to add in for from that side as well. And then, you know, I would have to say herbs uh, are very nutrient dense from a, from a different perspective. You're not necessarily going to get a lot of calories from it, but you will get a lot of different various nutrients that you need as well from things like oregano and thyme and uh we're, we grow a lot of that type of stuff and we throw it into pretty much every meal i don't know what that is i'll check that out um brown powder came up whenever i don't know what is that what could that be here Mold spores, possibly. I mean, that's like, or like uh, mushroom spores. I mean, that's one that I can really think of. Is like, but I don't know. 
I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure, Amber. I'm how sorry. how wet was the was the soil? Like maybe it was. Just yeah, like... send me a picture at to Dell at seedspoon dot net. Um, here, let me put up a one second. Here, if you could email me, please. Here. With the picture, um, maybe I'll have an idea once I see it. So, um, just shoot that over to me, and I'll I'll let you know, Amber. Um, it depends on where you are. It's possible. Um, yellowing and flopping over though is different. Like typically, when our potato plants are starting to die, they're browning and turning mm -hmm. over. Yellowing and turning over tells me more of an, a, a nutrient deficiency. Um, now, if it's aphids, they would be on the potatoes, but we've never had issues with aphids on potatoes causing that big of a deal. Um, I would think nutrient deficiency. Um, and maybe how's the watering going, too? That's where my mind would go as well. And maybe it's too much water. That could be another possibility is either not enough water, which the soil should be really dry in that case, or too much water. Um, where that would cause the nitrogen not to be absorbed and then it would cause it to yellow as well. Uh, I wouldn't think aphids for potatoes, though. All right. Well, we are at our hour. We are. So, that went by so fast. I know. It, it always, always goes does. by so fast. Wow. I appreciate all of y'all joining. Um, it's always a lot of fun. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's popping. So okay. <laughs> Aw. Thank you, Tony. Very nice. Yeah, we love doing these. So please, um, you know, uh, what, what was it, what are we going to say now? <laughs> what are we doing well, now? We'll, we'll, we'll be here next week also. Yeah, every we'll week do we do these live Friday. streams. Friday at 12 o'clock. And then we have lots of videos going out on YouTube too. And make sure you're commenting. Oh, it's not a seeding square this month. It is uh -oh. the tomato fertilizer, the Espoma. Um, so if you... Enter to win the Espoma fertilizer in our monthly contest. Yep. We also had an app update that went out uh, yesterday that fixes an issue with the Garden Plus section. So uh, one bug that was reported this week was that whenever you go to log an event for a plant, uh, plants that were in archive were still showing in that list. So we released an update that fixes that and um have a lot more updates coming very soon we are hard at work on a number of things so i'm, I'm very excited to be able to show you all very soon um i got so the custom plants is is coming along really well patrick's been working on that um i'll show you all some screenshots on the next live stream Hopefully yeah. we'll be able you to guys show. will be very excited because that's something yeah. that i know everybody really wanted i really want it too it's awesome so you can I'm go through and create your own excited. plant and then choose all the different things and then and all that so uh, Patrick's been working really hard on that. I'll have some screenshots to show next week. Um, what else do we need to update them on? Happy Mother's good. Day to all the moms out there. Yeah. Hope you all have a good weekend. Hope hope you all have good weather where you are. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope, hope everyone has, has a good weekend. And hope you're able to enjoy your Mother's Day. And we will see you all next week. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone. Bye.